it seems that um, it's one law for uh, those of us in the Southwest and in uh, those areas that didn't in their majority vote for the Liberal Party. Mm -hmm. And it's quite another law for those um, in the East and Northern parts of this city uh, who in their majority did vote for the Liberal Party. The force was it's a lot more than that was used, let's say, in the Northern beaches or Bondi, mm -hmm. uh, when, when people are not following, you know, as much as what they follow in here. I think this whole struggle for a people's vaccine is something that hasn't been discussed much, certainly not in the mainstream in Australia. Well, I would like to welcome everyone to the Green Left discussion today. Uh, we're coming to you from around Australia. My name is Kamala Emanuel and I'm speaking to you from Turrbal and Jagera country here in Mianjin, Brisbane. Uh, we're currently experiencing the COVID pandemic in Australia with about um, half the country in some kind of uh, lockdown or subject to stay at home orders of some description in New South Wales, Victoria, ACT and Northern Territory. And um, the, so I'd like to acknowledge actually that um, Aboriginal people in particular are feeling the um, feeling the pandemic as it creeps out to regional and remote areas, particularly in New South Wales, and that vaccination rates have been low. Um, as um, and this is a you know this is an issue of concern. But my my guests today are actually from the epicenter really of the um, of Australia's current outbreak in in Western Sydney. Susan Price. Paula and Graham Matthews, um, all of whom who are in Sydney. So I'll turn to you first, Susan, if you'd like to tell us a bit about where you are and what the context is. Sure, thanks, Kamala. Um, I just want to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from the lands of the Baramatagal people of the Darug Nation. Uh, so I'm in Parramatta in Sydney's northwest. It's located about 20 kilometres to the northwest of Sydney. And uh, we're I mean, living in one of the 12 local government areas of concern um, that have been, you know, uh, focused on by the government for harder um, lockdown. Uh, I mean, the situation here is that, you know, I think if the numbers were going in the right direction, people would probably be coping a lot better with um, lockdown. But I think really it's, it's very challenging. We're now... We've just ticked over into the second month, um, the end of the second month of lockdown. Um, I mean, I, I would consider myself pretty lucky because I have a house, you know, plenty of room, can work from home, have a partner and a, a lovely dog, can take for walks and a little sunny um, backyard to sit in. But uh, certainly that's not the experience for majority of the population living in Parramatta. Um, it's a very, you know, a lot of high density um, housing here now. And people have been relying on the local parks and gardens to get out and um, get fresh air. But as of um, this week, we're now restricted to only exercise for one hour a day, um, no recreation. Um, and a curfew from 9 p.m. until 5 a.m. So uh, that you know com compounds already existing stresses that people are feeling of income um, uh, being cooped up um, in small living quarters with you know other people, um, you know loss of jobs, hardships, and um, you know, just the general frustrations of trying to homeschool children while doing your day job um, in many cases. So, yeah, but I guess to put a bit of global perspective on it, I was reminded by a friend of mine who lives in Mexico that the uh, daily average there is 18 and a half thousand cases a day. Um, so while we've just clocked over 1,029 cases today in, in New South Wales, it's always good to have a bit of a global perspective on things. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. Thanks, Susan. Paula, do you want to just tell us where you are and, and how you see things in, in general right at the moment? Yeah, and, and well, I'll give you my full name, Paula Sanchez. <laughs> Actually, I'm, well, I'm a 
sort of healthcare worker slash lecturer. I, I, I teach nursing. I'm a lecturer at the university with um, nursing students. So, and I do research in, in the health area. So I'm sort of close to what's happening, even though I am not working clinically at the moment, but I'm very aware of what's happening due to, you know, being involved in with the students, some, some of them, you know, COVID positive, uh, having difficulties, overseas students, uh, that they don't have permanent visas or permanent residencies and with um, that are COVID positive and they have to be isolated. So, uh, yeah, I, I work in that area. I am from the, you know, the hot zones. Um, I lived for many years in Fairfield and now in Liverpool, uh, which are, you know, one of the areas that have been, you know, um, heavily monitored, I should say, <laughs> and restricted from for a while now. Uh, and we had the experience of seeing the police on the streets, the police on horses on the street, the military as well. Uh, and it's interesting because I've been um, being a person from a different country, from a came from a dictatorship. Um, uh, somebody from SBS called me, you know, he's doing a, a program and he was asking, seeing the experience of his own family, uh, asking how is this affecting people that have come from a countries where we have repression through police, you know, through the army forces. Uh, I don't compare it. I, I don't think it's the same. Uh, it is different. But I have to say that myself and other colleagues and, and friends somehow have felt the, um, I don't know whether to use the word discrimination, but they felt that the force was it's a lot more than that was used, let's say, in the northern beaches of Bondi. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when people are not following, you know, as much as what they're following here. Mm. So this is what I am at the moment. And um, Susan said it, and I've been lucky as well that I, I'm, I'm working from home. I got the facilities of, of being able to work from home. I'm quite busy, so I haven't had time to get bored, really. Mm. Mm. And I go for walks. Um, well, we know that now that restrictions are, are going to be ease a little bit, so we can have picnics from I think which day, I can't remember a few days time, we'll be able to have picnic, but only within the five kilometer radius and only if you're fully vaccinated. So I guess we can talk a bit more about that uh, throughout the conversation. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, thank you. All right, Graham, and I might throw it over to you now uh, to just uh, describe your city. Southwest Sydney in the suburb of Bardia, which is uh, down towards Ingleburn, uh, for those mm -hmm. who know Sydney on uh, Darawal, uh, country. Um, there's three of us here, um, two adults and a, and, a, and a young child. So, um, you know, the house feels terribly crowded uh, a lot of the time. But um, again, we're in that um, very lucky position of um, uh, both adults being able to work from home. So um, there are a lot of um, uh, health workers and others. Um, I just went for a short walk around the block uh, before this um, meeting and there was uh, somebody jumping out of a car in a clinical uniform. So there are obviously a lot of people who are um, continuing to have to go out and effectively battle the pandemic uh, in, you know, essential jobs of one sort or another. Um, but yeah, look, looking forward to the discussion. Thanks and welcome to everyone. So let's, let's talk then about, um, uh, about the, uh, the, the deficiencies of, of lockdown life. And um, I mean, I appreciate that, that um, everyone has had that kind of perspective of it, it could be worse and, and recognising your own um, personal experiences, but now just sort of stepping back and thinking how it is for people, let's say across Sydney and um, particularly in those local government areas of concern that have been subjected to um, high levels of, of policing. What would you say about um, what sort of the, the difference between the policing measures that we've seen and the kind of health measures that, that you think we should be seeing? Well, I think something that happened overnight that really brought this home, the whole problem home to me, of a, you know, the lack of a people-centred, health-centred approach is the fact that three the three people who died in the last 24 hours in New South Wales were all being cared for in the community. So they were obviously extremely ill, um, but for one reason or another, were not um, in, a, in the care of a hospital. 
Mm. And that's not the first time that that's happened. And I think what that does, and I mean, respectfully understanding there, you know, obviously there are individual circumstances people are in, but it does make you wonder um, what were the reasons why people were so ill and still at home? Um, and uh, how do people fall through the net like that? Um, and I, I think it's pretty clear, and there's a lot of stories coming through of the fact that, you know, people um, might have, you know, children that they're trying to look after while a partner is ill or in hospital, um, or they're too afraid to call an ambulance, too afraid to even get tested because they're not sure what the result will be. Will it be a positive and what's that going to mean for them and their family? Um, and, you know, very worrying reports over the last couple of days in regard to the stresses that are being put on the hospital system. Mm -hmm. And it means, I think that there's a real, been a real lack of attention to the health response and an over emphasis on a punitive law and order response. And I think that this is sadly the outcome in a rich country like Australia of where you mix a pandemic with neoliberal austerity. And I mean, we're, you know, we're relatively well off and, and, and a rich country, but it certainly, um, you know, we're all aware uh, of the fact that, you know, in the last New South Wales budget, for example, um, the police got um, $4.7 billion, I think it was, um, out of the last New South Wales budget. Meanwhile, you know, we've got, a really a health system that's rapidly approaching crisis point um, and not just be, you know which is being exacerbated by the pandemic we've got shortages of teachers you know you name it um, and and so much of the community care and outreach and information um, activities that are happening are being led by um, the non-government sector so the community sector um, charities, churches, you know, um, and so on. Now, while that's not a bad thing in itself, what's actually happening is that there's a vacuum that's been left there that's had to be filled um, by organisations that don't necessarily have the capacity to be able to deliver the sorts of, you know, health-centred um, support to people in communities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, and Paula, what's what's your what's your take on on? Yeah, actually, um, you know, Susan, you know, Susan said something very important. There is the the allocation of resources since very early in this pandemic. You know, when it first started, uh, I always said this. It put in evidence the lack of the health system in those countries, and it's looking at the deficiencies of our system. I worked in the health system for a very long time. I was a critical care nurse working in intensive care, mm -hmm. working in other areas for about 20 years, now teaching students. And I can see the, the system is struggling. The, there's not enough, even though we are a well-off country, we have a lot of ventilators. We, we have, you know, the system was well set up. And in fact, with the first wave of the pandemic, last year, um, for example, in the Liverpool intensive care unit, there were plenty ventilators and they were in use. They were prepared, over prepared for what was happening. It didn't happen. But now it's actually reaching a point where you have to, you know, not just intensive care, but in, in the wards, they have to send people home to be able to take other people in. Mm -hmm. And it does worry me a lot what, and of what is the level of um, assessment of people that are being cared at home mm -hmm. and how sick they are. Uh, personally, I have spoken to people that are positive in the homes with the families, feeling really unwell. And, and I just said, look, are they calling you often? So yeah, I get phone calls, uh, but it's so hard because it's communication, you know, there's not really telehealth. It's more like a phone conversation to assess somebody, say, now how are you feeling today? 
-hmm. And per person can actually say, oh, I'm not too bad. And they may be really bad. So mm -hmm. how are they assessing these people at home? Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting because I was just teaching this today with the students talking about communication in health and texting and how do we communicate? Can, how can we assess the health of somebody on the phone? How can we assess the mental health of somebody of the phone when we have to actually look at the person, look at the affect, look at the face? Mm -hmm. uh, so I can see that um, there's a lot of things that are filing in the system. And I think um, it, financially, is, is the problem. I think with the, the allocation of resources, the government haven't put the money, instead of spending all that money, putting all the army on the streets, maybe put the money into education. If people are convinced and, you know, with education of the reason why they need to be vaccinated, so they're vaccinated or isolated and do other measures so people are, are okay, I think they'll be less resistant. I got the feeling that that would be because if you enforce something, it, it doesn't work. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of issues there. I mean, Susan talked about a lot of issues, but we can continue on with the conversation yeah. and pass yeah. it on to, to Graham. <laughs> yeah. yeah, take it away, Graham. Well, the priorities seem to be asked about, let's say. Uh, the news yesterday was saying that um, ambulances were literally queuing outside of Blacktown Hospital with mm -hmm. the poor um, paramedics having to, um, you know, uh, put blankets on themselves just to stay warm uh, in this unseasonably cold weather we're having at the moment. Um, we're being told that um, COVID patients are now to be triaged in outdoor tents outside of hospitals. And yet at the same time, the government seems to have unlimited money for, uh, for repression. So uh, following on from Susan, just last night, um, I was out and about and um, the, uh, the, the eye in the sky, you know, the, um, the, the, the police helicopters were just simply buzzing around continually around the Bardia area. And I'm sure this is a, a, a factor, as, um, as Paul has explained it, uh, for those who live in Liverpool and more particularly even Fairfield. Uh, but this continual um, uh, surveillance and um, really quite um, uh, repressive surveillance from um, police uh, on the weekend, there were police and army driving around the streets, you know, with this sense of trying to catch people out. Um, this kind of um, attitude of uh, that it's really, it's all your fault. And um, it's, it's people misbehaving. Misbehaving how? By taking their kids out for more than one hour a day, uh, by uh, forgetting to put on a mask when they pop outside for a quick walk, um, by going for a bike, a bike ride. Um, and at the same time, uh, a friend of mine was saying that um, a friend of his was down at uh, Bondi, works at Bondi uh, on the weekend, and, and there were people out there having picnics on the beach and so forth. I mean, it seems that um, it's one law for uh, those of us in the Southwest and in uh, those areas that didn't, in their majority, vote for the Liberal Party. And it's quite another law for those um, in the eastern northern parts of this city uh, who, in their majority, did vote for the Liberal Party. And, and you've got to think about the um, that how much how much is going to be effective. I mean, I think there's no question we need effective public health interventions to reduce the transmission of the virus. Like, it, you know, that's that's got to be. Uh, um, I wish it went without saying, but it was bears saying. But um, but if we if we look at some of the measures, and I, I guess I'm thinking particularly a curfew where for people to be able to, and, and, and the one hour um, uh, restriction to, um, to exercise. The idea that there's no way people can, you know, be in parks or be walking around the block or, or, the, or, or what have you, that there's no way that that can be done safely other than by these punitive restrictive methods with their surveillance. That's got to be interrogated. In fact, I think we've just got to say it's bullshit, <laughs> you know, really straight up. Um, be because um, and, and when you're weighing up, you know, the these things have to be commensurate. And and all these, even if just from a legalistic point of view, um, the the laws allowing all these kind of public health orders, they all talk about the the measures needing to be commensurate with the risk. So they've they've got to be averting something in order to be able to um, to be justified. And if, you know, what is the difference? Like literally, what is the difference between someone going for a walk um, 
uh, five minutes before the curfew and five minutes after, um, really, there's, or, you know, three hours after, or, or someone coming home from working a, a night shift or working an evening shift or something, and then not being allowed to get out and about. You know, they, these sort of things just feel like it's a, um, a blanket that's designed to give the impression of doing something without actually doing something. Uh, and they've seemed to have left um, kind of a huge gaping hole in terms of workplace safety. I wonder if anyone um, has, uh, has anything that they're, they're aware of um, in terms of the workplaces where transmissions are going on um, that, that just doesn't seem to be getting much of a, a, an airing at the, um, at the daily press conferences or uh, the, you know, on, on talkback or anything like that. Well, I think there, there's a few, I mean, some of them are reaching the mainstream media. Um, there was a case recently, uh, mid-August, of Costco, you know, the big uh, warehouse mega markets, um, you know, when they, you know, you know, this is the idea, you know, you've got these multinationals where it's like, you know, we've got to open the new store no matter what, you know, um, you meet the deadlines, meet, meet your KPIs, you know, this kind of thing, um, driving decision making. And, you know, this new store in the Hunter Valley brought people up from Sydney to train up the workforce, um, unbeknownst to one of the workers, they were COVID positive and uh, were responsible for infecting other workers um, in the warehouse, you know, but it was like, you know, it's like that, that situation of where, where the bottom line comes first and, you know, the, the deadline to open up and have your staff trained and ready to rock and roll, you know, um, outweighs everything else. Um, and now you've got a situation where as a result of this infection, most of the, the hunters locked down, you know, so I mean, even if Costco wanted to open, you know, it couldn't, you know, so it's like this kind of insane, irrational mindset um, of the business class that, uh, you know, puts their right to make a profit ahead of the rights of workers to a safe workplace. Um, mm. And, you know, yeah, I mean, it's just, I think there was another case recently, you know, in the, I think warehousing, it's been a big problem in the food industry, it's been a big problem. Um, there's a lot, I think there's a lot of workplace transmission going on that you'll never hear about. Um, because if it's a closed, you know, environment where it's just the employees and no members of the public coming in, then they're never, it's never going to see the light of day unless workers are prepared to actually, um, you know, blow the whistle on, on what's going on in their workplaces. And that basically takes having a strong union behind mm. you to do that. Um, and fortunately, in the case of this, you know, warehouse worker who was a member of the United Workers Union, um, at Coles um, in their um, uh, Eastern Creek warehouse, you know, he he told the story about how a COVID positive worker started shift. You know, was working shift with him, found got a phone call, was informed that a member of the family had tested positive, and then about a couple of hours later confirmed that he, that he was, or not maybe not that he was, yeah, that he could be positive as well. And it took hours and hours for the for delegates on the job, health and safety delegates, fortunately with the union support to not only get other people in the workplace informed that it, this had happened, mm -hmm. to get the shift actually stopped and get the place properly cleaned mm -hmm. and the, the shift that was due to start properly informed that mm -hmm. um, there was a risk, um, you know, and that, that took literally hours and hours of time of not only these workers, but also the delegate, um, mm. the delegate and their organisers on the job. So, you know, and this is Coles. I mean, this is a, this is a company that's, well, first of all, made mega profits during the pandemic um, and, you know, has, you know, has had 18 months to kind of get things in order and to make its COVID safe workplace a reality, not just on paper, but in practice. So, you know, they're just two examples. I mean, let alone the, the what discussions are going on behind closed doors in regard to the reopening up of the construction industry, for example. Um, 
you know, it took literally two weeks between Gladys Berejiklian and announcing the closure, the shutdown of the construction industry to it basically being flipped um, and reopened again. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of money there, uh, a lot of profits, uh, clearly, um, and big developer interests um, that are, you know, trying their best to ensure that um, projects are, you know, completed on time and um, and so on, let alone, of course, you know, you've got the situation where, of course, you've got poor construction workers who are also, you know, out of work. But, you know, at the same time, you've got to balance up all of these these risks, you know, and and what risks are you putting workers workers under, particularly when you're working in indoor settings. Um, but not only that, um, yeah. And now, Alison Pennington was recently um, interviewed on the the ABC, and the the Australia Institute has um, has collated this has got this on uh, this interview online, and she drills down into some of the measures that were implemented in Victoria last year. Uh, to ensure employer compliance. And this seems to be something that's missing in the New South Wales, um, uh, you know, under the Berejiklian Hazard kind of government, uh, that they don't seem to be uh, ensuring, you know, ro rolling out any kind of compliance measures to make sure that workplaces are adhering to just what you said, Susan, to ad adhering to their COVID-19 plans. Um, whether or not they've even, you know, have, have they got the plans? Are they implementing them? Are PPE um, and, and social distancing being adhered to on the workplace and are, are workplaces making sure of it? And, and I think that, um, that this is where the, the kind of the, the punitive versus health approach is, is really kind of being seen because there's a lot of talk about, you know, people doing the wrong thing. And you hear this every day in the, the media conferences about, um, you know, a kind of a school teacherish, um, people are misbehaving uh, thing. Whereas the question of uh, employers um, ensuring that their workplace is safe and that it's complying with, um, you know, the the most um, the the safest way of, of ensuring that that people have the the least risk, um, if not as close to zero as possible, of, of transmission in the workplace. You know, the way the government's responded in New South Wales is probably closer to the federal government's, you know, attitude. They seem to be in lockstep, you know, with each other. And, um, you know, when they talk about, you know, the, the what do they call it, red tape busting and all this, you know, this, this is the ideology of small government and the ideology of self-regulation, of deregulation um, coming up against a pandemic. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's just a dogged refusal um to have government or health officials you know you're not you're not talking about bureaucrats we're talking about health health officials mm -hmm. actually intervening and in you know at at um, the point of industry you know at, in the in the um in the economic sphere but it's essential i mean that's that's how we're going to that's how we've got to we've, we've got to um approach it if we're actually going to suppress this virus yes imagine if that that huge budget that you mentioned with the um uh, how much the police got out of the latest new south wales budget imagine if some of that had gone to increasing a health workforce that could go um industry to industry workplace to workplace and and check on um on workers safety uh as well as as you say um giving giving workers confidence in in a kind of a strong union um but if that was being backed up with, um, you know, <laughs> worksite visits, um, and uh, the, the other thing that um, the other thing that would well replace um, the police, you know, punitive police measures would be the kind of thing that makes it possible for people to stay home. And I wonder if any of you um, have thoughts on the level of income support that's currently available uh, for people in lockdown or people. Um, knowing they need to be tested. Miserable and inadequate. Can't remember the exact figure that the uh, Barry Chickley and government's offering people uh, if they're forced to stay home to get a test, but it's even less than the relatively small amount that the, um, the, the, the Andrews government gave people last year. And frankly, $750 a week. It started off at, I think, what was it, 500? Then they uh, slowly boosted it up to 600 and then finally up to 750. 
which is the amount from uh, JobKeeper for last year. But for those uh, working and living in Sydney, which has the highest uh, property values, the highest rents in Australia, uh, trying to make ends meet on $750 a week, particularly uh, in a situation where you may have been uh, in an industry where you're earning twice, three times more than that, um, at a, at, in a situation where, where mortgages are not uh, fixed, rents aren't stopped, uh, food prices are going through the roof, um, it's, it's, it's an insult to, to working people to try to, to have to put up with this. Even somebody like Alan Kohler, who was hardly a, uh, a, 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 you know, could hardly be described as a, as a communist in any sense, was on Q&A uh, just the other week, more or less saying that the Australian government should be adopting the 80% uh, the, 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 the rule, which was brought in by the British and I think perhaps the New Zealand government um, last year. Um, he was saying that there's a cap on it, obviously, um, for, for those on extremely high incomes, but there needs to be something commensurate to encourage those who shouldn't be working to stay at home and still be able to pay the bills. Um, or on the, other, on, the other, uh, uh, on the other side, actually forcing the banks to take a haircut um, so that mortgages are not just simply paused with interest ticking over every minute of every day, but they actually be stopped so that uh, people are given a mortgage holiday for this period of time. And indeed that, that landlords cop the same, uh, uh, even landlords for small businesses cop the same haircut. Um, currently uh, your shop might be closed, but you still have to pay that rent to your landlord. Um, there are a lot of big business and large landlords who are making an absolute mozza out of this pandemic. Um, even setting aside the, 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 the monstrosity of Harvey Norman, and the, uh, the, the mega profits they made out of, of JobKeeper last year, there are still uh, large businesses making large amounts of money from this pandemic. Um, and really some of that money should go back to, to working people in this period who are really doing it very tough. And, and Paula, what about the, you were talking before about students who you're in contact with and, and perhaps you've got something to say. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I, 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 yeah, no, I agree with Graham and, and, and Susan. Uh, and I was just, just before talking about the students, I was thinking, you know, when they were doing all these fines of people that were protesting in the city and in Melbourne, and they're getting thousands and thousands of dollars, where is that money going? Is that being put into the people that are actually struggling? Or is it going to the revenues of the government or the police? Or how, how are they, what are they doing with all this? There's a lot of money there. I mean, yeah. huge Good amounts question. of money. Yeah, or they, you know, for just one big group the other day, I was just thinking about at least half a million dollars, just easy, you know, for a few that they, they did on the day. So, yeah, um, yeah, it is affecting people. Um, I'm, I'm lucky enough to be in a university that are giving support to students, and this is from the university, but they, they're not getting from the government. The university gives, um, um, I should mention the university because I, I'm very proud that they're doing this. It's uh, Western Sydney University that when the students actually, they go to the support services and they have issues with income and money, etc. They give them a voucher so they can get a voucher, you know, monthly. Mm -hmm. Some students get uh, one of uh, one of $1,000 and I think they've been giving uh, a couple of times to students. It is good, but it's, of course, it's not enough for students that have to pay rent. Mm. And the landlords, they're not producing the rent. They're not giving any facilities. They still have to keep paying the rent. Mm. Um, they study from home. Some of them, many students are having the issue of, because I teach in the School of Nursing at Midwifery, uh, allocations of students to um, clinical practice has been an issue mm. um, because they, they need, they need, they now actually, the students need to be fully vaccinated to be able to do clinical. So it's been very hard and some students are very worried that they may not be able to finish in time to graduate, uh, not this year, to get new positions because there's not enough, they're not vaccinated to start with, and there's not enough, many hospitals are cutting on a allocation of students for clinical practice. Yeah. Saying this, and looking at the shortage of nurses and, and, and midwives and healthcare workers, there are jobs now being offered to even first year students 
and I'm worried about the safety issue here, mm -hmm. but they're offering to any student a job before they never, none, none, none of the hospitals employ anybody earlier than second year nursing as assistant nurses. Now they are employing from first year to help in any way that they can. So to work as assistant nurses, of course, cheap labor, it is cheap, mm -hmm. um, but I also worry about the safety part of it. Yeah. Uh, it is good our students are getting jobs, but um, it's some I mean, in the vaccination hubs. Uh, but um, many have been offered jobs because they're not willing to employ full registered nurses, they're employing students, and that is a way of trying to cover uh, help. They mm -hmm. need help. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they employ a lot of students to be able to help in the hubs, vaccination hubs. Just as an administrative, they're training them to do, inject, to do the vaccinations, they're training them to do testing. So basically, ship labor to be able to actually fill those positions to be able to comply to what the government wants. Yeah. 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 I wanted to um, just sort of segue completely to a slightly different um, angle on, on what's going on. And, and that is um, that is sort of, you mentioned, Paula, the. Um, the protesters, you mentioned them being fine, but let's even just think about that phenomenon of, of anti-lockdown protests that that are being framed as, as being for freedom. And um, I, I wondered what your thoughts are, maybe starting with you, Paula, on um, on the basis of these, uh, you know, why people are rallying and, and what it what it means and, and um, what could be done to undercut the the popularity of these protests, which obviously seem to be kind of uh, coming in wave after wave. To start with, uh, I understand um, some, some, the frustration of many people, uh, many business people that are doing it. A lot of the people in the protests are people that are losing money on their businesses. Uh, it's interesting. It's interesting that um, when I I saw the first protest in Sydney. And looking at the people there, and I was thinking, and it's interesting, from a non-Western person myself, I think, wow, there's a lot of white people in there. I, that was my mm -hmm. first comment, you know. And, and somebody responded, well, oh, you know, what about the Black Lives Matter movement? I said, it's not the same thing. Um, I think, um, yeah, people do have the right to protest. People who do have, you know, they still have the right to protest and express themselves, but not at the cost of the health of other people. And I think that's the issue here is basically if they were safe, you know, using masks. But many of the people in those protests that I've seen in Sydney are, yes, anti-government, anti-lockdown, but they're also anti-vax and anti-testing. So unfortunately, uh, that is dangerous, and, and and I think we can mix things, you know. Mm. Yeah, I'm angry, I'm upset with the government, they're not doing the right things, and they mm. they stuffed up, you know, with the vaccinations, they should have done it a little earlier, we should all be vaccinated by now through education, etc. But um, but putting other people at risk, and, and you know, and people have been infected, and the spread has gone further, we know now as a fact, through clusters and group of people that have gone together, had, you know, we, we know the case of the people, I think it was in Bondi when there was a party and 16 of those people are positive now. Uh, so it's, um, it is a fact. It is a fact that people that are half vaccinated or not vaccinated are sicker. They're the ones that are ventilated and sicker in hospitals. So it is, it is happening. It's, it's, this thing about COVID doesn't exist is not true. It does exist. Okay. People are getting sick, but... Um, I think there's a time and a place, and I think it's, um, you just have to be a bit more logical in the way it is, it is okay to protest, but maybe find other ways that they can express themselves without putting others at risk, not be selfish about it. Mm. And, and I think one of the big things that's, what, that's one of the big features of, of these are not just the, the sort of anti-lockdown um, and anti-vax elements, but, but frankly, uh, neo-Nazi and, and you know you know the the um, presence of um, anti-Semitic graffiti after some of the rallies and uh, and you know yeah people who are frankly white supremacists um, participating in and um, and building themselves through this kind of vague uh, you know we want freedom uh, kind of thing and I, th I think there is um, real concern about that I wonder what your thoughts are Susan well I yeah, I think it it's certainly important to 
distinguish between the actual hardships people are facing under lockdown and the frustrations and the actions of, you know, the far right, um, along with, you know, very, various far right conspiracy types or just conspiracy theorists and, you know, and, and people who are a bit unhinged. <laughs> um, because, you know, and certainly, certainly the makeup of those rallies was mixed, but I think, um, you know, and it would be a mistake to just, yeah, just say it was just a, you know, rent a crowd. I think um, there's definitely a battle for hearts and minds going on out there. And the far right are very consciously uh, seeking to exploit the hardships and frustrations that are going on out there, the racist, policing you know that is actually is real um the racial profiling about covid that is very real but also the um yeah the economic hardship i think mainly economic and social hardships that people are facing i mean the far right has an interest in trying to exploit that the fear the confusion um and anxiety um for their own purposes so yeah i i i I think these freedom rallies, it's sort of becoming clearer that, you know, there is a, a, a sort of international social media based organisation of these um, Freedom Day rallies. Um, so, you know, I think we, we need to be clear and understand who the enemy is here. And certainly, you know, the presence of, um, of identifiable far right groups in the protests in I think certainly in Melbourne and probably Sydney too although I you know I wasn't at them so I couldn't say for sure but um is very real we also know that there are far right sympathizers within the police force too so you know that's that's a whole other aspect of it. it's incumbent on us to to be making demands around the very things that are causing these hardships and worsening the crisis, because that is actually the most, you know, battling against those is the most effective way to defeat this kind of, you know, move towards um, this so-called, you know, libertarian, alt-right libertarian um, um, movement that's clearly trying to get a foothold, more of a foothold in Australia. I, I think that's a, a really important point, Susan, because I think a, a lot of the like liberal commentary tends to, you know, focus on individual members of the far right and you know find you know an object as they should to their their racism or um, other uh, other things, but not necessarily have a have a kind of a comprehensive understanding of of the need to to tackle the hardship that people are going through because of the government's failures to provide income support, to um, have a clear timeline of what's going to happen with the vaccination rollout um, and, and to give people the kind of the reassurance that we need, that we can get through this together, but that we are in it together, not because they just mouth platitudes, but, but, because, um, but because resources are, are being mobilised, uh, you know, from the health point of view and, and financially to help people through, which yeah. really is And even in the, I mean, in the media, you've seen, I mean, they, lately or even this week or next, or they, they're doing a couple of programs of neo-Nazis in, in Sydney or in Australia. Mm. And mm. there's one big headline, they're recruiting people in Australia. So they're trying to focus it on that rather than the real essence of the issue. Related, but slightly different. It's hardly a wonder um, when you think about it that um, there is a, you know, a fairly sizable part of the population that doesn't, that thinks that COVID's a hoax or doesn't believe in vaccines or frankly doesn't believe in science. I mean, this, this government and governments like it has spent the last 30 years trying to convince us that the science of climate change is wrong, mm -hmm. uh, that we can continue to um, dig up coal like it's going out of fashion and, um, you know, be the largest exporter of, um, of, of natural gas, so-called natural gas in the world, and that it has no impact on, um, on global warming. Uh, when the scientists are saying exactly the opposite, you know, denying that the uh, the Great Barrier Reef is uh, in its final uh, death throes, uh, while at the same stage, then they turn around and say, oh, but with the, 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 the vaccine scientists say blah, blah, blah. It's hardly a wonder that those who don't necessarily pay a great deal of attention uh, to, to world events, who who don't necessarily, who didn't necessarily, you know, study science at high school or whatever it might be, come to the conclusion that really, uh, all this is all gump, and um, it's it's all it is is simply stopping me from going to work and earning a decent living. 
um, mm. and and making up, you know, falling foul or falling um, subject to the kind of uh, conspiracy theories spread by the far right. And it's also not simply the far right. It's you, all you need to do is turn on Sky After Dark. Um, Alan Jones interviewing Craig Kelly, for instance. Mm. I mean, the, the degree of, um, of backwardness of uh, misinformation and, frankly, lies that these people spread, uh, it's, it's hardly a wonder that there are so many people who doubt uh, that there's any veracity to this, particularly that, um, you know, albeit that it's widespread, that um, COVID is still uh, particularly confined to certain pockets. So certain parts of the country, um, you know, looking at areas, for instance, where our great prime minister comes from down at Sutherland Way, where COVID really hasn't taken much of a hold, it's hardly a wonder, which is where Craig Kelly comes from, it's hardly a wonder that um, people in those areas uh, may be susceptible to this um, kind of anti-scientific nonsense. St sticking with the anti-scientific um, question, uh, vaccination, to, to vaccinate, to not vaccinate, should it be, should, it, I, I feel like it's not hard to say, yes, let's vaccinate, but um, when do you think, do you, do you think, um, do you think is now is a time when we should be talking about whether it should be mandatory or is that a question that should be asked after it's been made available to everyone? And um, yeah, and, and what do people think about how, um, uh, how, how, the, how the conversation's panning out nationally and, and what should be really happening? Well, I, I mean, we, we have just been given, you know, given the right to have a picnic um, in two weeks time. <laughs> <laughs> as a celebration of having reached six million jabs in New South Wales, but behind that six million jabs, there's actually only there's still under one million people who are fully vaccinated in the whole of New South Wales. So that's a very low, still a very low number. Um, I mean, that's according to the New South Wales Health website that I was looking at today. So if those figures are wrong, blame New South Wales Health website for that. But um. You know, and you've got people like the mayor of Blacktown, which is a hotspot, um, pleading with the New South Wales Premier to open a mass vaccination hub in Blacktown because it doesn't have one currently. And people are having to travel 30 kilometres to get a jab. Um, the, um, you know, Indigenous health centres in Western Sydney are running out of vaccine supplies and, you um, don't have enough to fulfil the needs of the demand from um, from Indigenous communities living in that that area. Mm. So you know, there's a real. Um, I think the priority the priority is to get the majority of people vaccinated, and then and then work out ways to deal with that section of the population that is not vaccinated for one reason or another and, you know, work out why um, and what strategies can be adopted to actually close the gap, if you like, as much as possible. Mm. Um, I'm certainly, I certainly think the approach of the federal government is that it seems to me Morrison's trying to kind of play two sides of the argument here. He's trying to give a bit of comfort to the anti-vaxxers because he's sort of looking to his far right in that regard but then also trying to give the bosses comfort um, in sort of indicating that if they're happy to go to fair work or fight it out in the federal court, they might be able to, you know, win the right to um, impose mandatory vac vaccination on their workforce, you know, but all at the same time saying, oh, no, no, the federal government couldn't possibly intervene on this question, you know. I mean, I think really the, you know, the, the, you know, this has got to be handled from a health perspective. The question of of a vaccine and mand mandating vaccines has got to be a health decision. It can't be one left up to employers. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, but the reality is that we're nowhere near close enough yet to to uh, you know having a large enough section of the population vaccinated to you know and to fulfill the demand for supply to even start to have that conversation. I agree with, um, I agree with Susan about that, Susan about that, yeah. There's not enough vaccines to force people to do it. Mm. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's not possible. And even just telling people you're, you're not allowed to do something until you've been vaccinated without giving people the option of being vaccinated just feels intrinsically 
Uh, that doesn't make sense. Unfair. <laughs> That's yeah. fine. That's good, yeah. yeah. And mm. I might reckon people in government, the people taking the decisions about lockdown, the people making decisions about vaccines, should be healthcare workers. They should be, they should be taking the decision and telling, you know, the government, you know, them about what should be done, not their decision from a political point of view. It needs to be a health-based decision. And I think um, that is the big mistake here that they taking decisions according to their own political views. And I think it needs to be a different perspective there. And I think we can also, I mean, one of the things that should really be informing the national conversation is that overall, in general, vaccine coverage for most vaccine preventable diseases in Australia is something like 90%. Like it, in, in general, I mean, we, we do need particular work to be done in particular vulnerable communities and, and so on. But um, on the whole, people in Australia get vaccinated when they're offered vaccines, especially, you know, if it's offered for free and it's accessible, people generally do it. So it, it seems to me like that it just, um, the, the discussion of, of making it mandatory feels to me like it's... Um, it's more of the um, individualising blame uh, rather than making sure supply is socially there. Uh, it it seems, seems like it's more of that, you know, uh, LNP uh, neoliberal appro approach to saying it's all your fault as an individual if you haven't done it, rather than, you know, we as a government are going to make social provision so that everyone can, can do the thing that's good for our, our collective health. Um, there's, there's not many things I agree with um, Anthony Albanese on, but frankly, I think his um, idea of uh, paying people $300 to get vaccinated was, was a very good idea. Um, and if $300 doesn't encourage people, then make it $500. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, um, it costs a lot more than $300 to put somebody in ICU for one day. I'm sure um, Paula could probably tell us, uh, yeah. you know, with uh, round-the-clock nursing staff, ventilators and all the machines that go ping, it's certainly a lot more than $300 that um, uh, it would cost. But this, this nasty and frankly um, uh, punitive New South Wales government that fines people uh, if they step outside their house at the wrong time won't even give teachers paid time off to go and get vaccinated. Mm -hmm. It won't give public servants. Um, uh, I don't know. Paula could correct me, but it probably won't even give nursing staff paid time to go and get vaccinated. I mean, this is, you know, there needs to be an example set. Um, certainly local government, which I work in, does pay workers to, uh, to, to uh, take time to get vaccinated. But frankly, all employers, in fact, uh, vaccines should be offered uh, to people at work. Vaccines should be offered to students at school. Um, it, it, the, the accessibility of their vaccines should be massively increased. But I completely agree that um, it's totally premature to look at um, issues of making something mandatory. And the layers of bureaucracy people still have to go through to get a vaccination is just ridiculous. Um, if you were someone without a computer um, or with English as your second language, you'd find it really difficult to navigate around the eligibility requirements that you've still got to, you've still got to check if you're eligible to get a vaccine, mm. a vaccination in, um, in New South Wales, unless you happen to stumble on uh, in your local community, a, a, a pharmacy that's offering walk-in AstraZeneca appointments. But if you mm. try and find a list of all the pharmacies that are offering Vaccines, you, you won't be able to find one of those anywhere either. I've tried looking the last few days to, to look for a list um, and th there's none to be found. So it's still extremely hit and miss um, the way that it's being rolled out. I mean, in Liverpool, where, where, where Paula is, I was noticing that, you know, the walk-in clinics there, you know, like there's three or four of them, but they're just open one day a week. So mm. if you just happen to strike the right clinic on the right day, you might be able to walk in off the street and get a vaccination. But, you know, and you try and ring up for a, an appointment in the mass um, vaccination hub at Homebush, um, you'll be very lucky to get an appointment soon, you know. Um, and that that's a reality, you know. Like, uh, I mean, there was a recent survey that I saw um, I think was it was mentioned in an article in in Green Left recently that said that I think it was something like seventy nine percent of people 
had said that they were intending to get vaccinated. So, you know, I think that's a pretty positive um, response. 14% um, who said they weren't, they were still making up their minds. Well, you know, the, I think that in general reflects a real willingness, you know, on behalf of people to get vaccinated. The problem is definitely supply and it's, it's supply not just in, well, in the metropolitan centres, but also particularly in regional and rural centres, mm. which is a big problem, like it's a real worry. Mm. So, so you live, let, just um, more on the living with COVID versus, you know, suppression. Anyone else got thoughts? Broadly speaking, I think um, as a person with disability, um, the whole pandemic has um, put us back in our box, um, for want of a better way to put it. But, um, you know, I, I very rarely go out now. Um, and certainly when I do, I don't go uh, to, to any shops or anywhere else. I uh, will occasionally, um, you know, or fairly frequently go to the park and such with um, with my son and um, in the open air. But um, the, the situation the pandemic has made life, I think, um, increasingly difficult for those uh, with disability who are tend to be more susceptible to um, uh, the ill effects of COVID-19 and so forth. So in that sense, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm deeply concerned by this, um, this idea that, uh, that it's some magic number, whether it's 70, 80 or, uh, or even less a percentage of the population vaccinated, that all of a sudden we can all come out of the cave as uh, Scott Morrison mm -hmm. puts it, um, well, there's going to be some of us left in the cave, unfortunately. And um, until we actually um, sort this out and actually drive down numbers and defeat uh, the, the, the COVID-19, then um, there will be, there are disadvantaged sections of this society who will be forced to continue to isolate and continue not to uh, live as full citizens in this society. And I think it's beholden on the society to take that into account. Uh, when it makes plans for uh, for the way forward. Um, I might just um, ask around then if there are any final comments that, that people want to make about either the issue of, um, you know, what, what the future might look like li living living with COVID or, or suppressing um, or any of the other elements that, that we've touched on or might not have fully um, explored. Um, Susan, have you got any final thoughts? I think this whole struggle for a people's vaccine is something that hasn't been discussed much, certainly not in the mainstream in Australia, but is, is definitely a, um, a cause, a campaign that should be, um, should be publicised and made more of because really, you know, the idea that, um, that we're, you know, like, the idea that pharmaceutical profits should be put against ahead of the lives of you know of our regional neighbours and and countries in our region that are really struggling um, is just anathema should be anathema to any <laughs> progressive minded person. But I think the other thing too is also this ongoing struggle against neoliberal austerity um, because that's also worsen worsening the situation um, for the pandemic. And that's, you know, as we've said, that's what's undermined our health systems, um, even in wealthy countries, you know, let alone um, the situation in the countries of the global south. And I think that's a fight we've got to continue. Um, and finally, I think it's, you know, as Graham talked about before, this is also connected with the fight for serious action around our environment. Um, you know, the, the struggle, to preserve and reverse, preserve habitat and reverse habitat loss um, as a result of mining, um, agri big agribusiness and industrial farming um, and protecting biodiversity. You know, for the long term, if we're going to prevent future pandemics, you know, we, we've actually got to tackle these, these big questions too. And I know that, you know, that is a long, feels like a, a very big picture kind of way to finish, but. Um, it's all connected, and I think the the um, you know the battle the battles are linked, um, and I think we've we've just got to got to commit to um, trying to progress in any way we can the sorts of 
changes, fundamental changes that we know need to take place if we're going to not only resolve the COVID-19 situation, um, because it is going to take, I think, some very big political upheavals to do that um, successfully, unless we can come up with, you know, technologies and vaccines and, and so on that are going to be more effective. I think we, we're still butting up against those, you know, capitalism <laughs> and the right to profit ahead of, you know, the right to, to be safe and, and healthy. Um, so that, that's, you know, I think we're still going to need to confront those bigger issue questions going forward. Um, and Paula, last comments or thoughts from yourself? Yeah, actually, I was, I was going to say something similar to Susan that I I like to see. I I, I can see that the, the pandemic is not going to go away soon. Uh, we may end up the way I see the future. We may may end up with something similar than the flu, that it will become a regular. You know, every year we have to you know vaccinate or a couple of years get a booster to actually be able to 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 be okay. You know, not get infected or not get infected too bad you know, uh, to end up in hospital. But yeah, we cannot forget the fight for better health, a better system of health, you know, universal health. And and I think education, we cannot forget those things. Uh, I think the fight for the environment and those fights uh, cannot be left on the side and get distracted with this. I think this is part of, of, of a bigger picture as well. And as I said earlier today, this put in evidence the failures of the system so maybe we should just use those failures or what, how they showing now to try to improve because you know pain for for vaccine or pain for for anything is is it shouldn't be we should have a, a better system where people actually have access to all of the health that they can have and the education perhaps we will change the way education is and it's already changing and it may change forever that we end up you know being half online half face to face not a lot of online not spending money on campuses and big buildings perhaps that will change but it will take a, a good plan and a good socialist plan to do it and last words to you graham oh wow um look <laughs> i just want to uh focus on the ethics i suppose of the pandemic and um i think um sort of uh, re, um, reappraising some of the words, some of the comments that uh, Susan made earlier, that nobody is really safe in this situation until everybody is safe. And I think perhaps the, uh, was it the day after the uh, WHO um, called for a moratorium of um, giving out booster shots? So not simply uh, just actually uh, 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 vaccinating your entire population, but giving them booster shots. Uh, and in fact, instead giving that those uh, vaccinations to the third world, because as uh, as, as others have pointed out, uh, we none of us will be ultimately free of this pandemic until we are all as a as a world free of this pandemic. Uh, the state of Israel uh, doubled down on its decision to um, launch booster shots, and you had um, on the on the TV news um, images of um, Israeli citizens sort of. Uh, decrying the fact that they wanted to go and visit their uh, relatives in the States. Um, well, there really is no way out of this unless uh, we understand that we are all in it together. Um, I think the rhetoric at the moment um, is a false rhetoric. Um, there is one law for us and, and another law for them. Um, but um, the only way out of this is um, if health measures, Trump, uh, uh, Trump repressive measures, and if um, uh, what we do for ourselves, we also do for everybody else around the world, because um, there is only one solution to this, and that's to act as a as a united world uh, to actually rid ourselves of this of this horrible scourge. So that's it for today. Thank you everyone for watching, and thank you Susan, Paula, and Graham for your contributions to the discussion today. Don't forget, if you like our work, you can become a supporter, uh, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.